All right, in this video, I will be going over the final review. And uh, I just want to point out, it's essentially the same problems that you'll see in your final review, except the order is going to be different and it will have different numbers. Otherwise, it's the same. So let's go ahead and look at this. Um, I would encourage you, you know, some people may want to watch the whole video and I'll make comments about, uh, at least some comments about each problem. And a lot of them I'll go into some detail. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to contact me and I can clarify anything that's not clear or complete a problem or whatever is needed. So let's go ahead and get started. <coughs> Excuse me. On this first problem, this is what I call a formula problem. You've got this formula here. Notice T is the number of days of the campaign, and F of T is a percent. So we're finding the percentage, basically the percentage of the target market that buys a game. And so we need to find F of 25. So all you need to do is plug in 25 into this function, you just want to make sure you can put that into your calculator and get the correct answer, which is 63.21%. <coughs> Sorry, I've got to clear my throat here. All right, so on number two, we're supposed to find f of g of x and g of f of x. This is what we call the composition of functions. And I'm going to go ahead and do one, and if you can do, if you understand this one, the other one's very similar. So this is f of g of x by definition is equal to f of g of x. So we say these the same way. And in fact, the basic idea is we're plugging in one of the functions as an input, in this case g of x, into another function, in this case f. And so we're going to find f of g of x, but of course g of x is 4x minus 6. So we're going to plug in 4 in, 4x uh, minus 6 into the function f. Now notice that function squares the input and subtracts 29. So we're going to square this input and subtract 29. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, when you multiply this out, basically this is what I call foil in disguise. You can write out two 4x minus 6's and foil them or multiply them out. The shortcut is to square the first term and you get 16x squared. If you multiply these two terms together you get negative 24x. If you double that you get your middle term. And then negative 6 times negative 6 or negative 6 squared is 36. And so when you simplify this you end up with 16x squared minus 48x plus 7. Now the other thing we're supposed to do is find the domain. <coughs> And here it is, all real numbers. And basically what you do with this composition of functions is you first look at the inner function. Notice we begin by plugging x into the g function. So the first thing we do is we look at the domain of g. Well, for a linear function, the domain's all real numbers. I can plug any number in, multiply it by 4, and subtract 6, and get an output that's a real number. And similarly, a quadratic function also has a domain of all real numbers. But here we're just interested in g. And once we've done that, we want to look at our final output, which is quadratic, which means it also has a domain of all real numbers. And so our domain is all real numbers. So in other words, our output here doesn't add any restrictions to our domain. Now if this had been a fraction and I had x in the denominator, then that would mean x can't be 0. That would be a restricted value. And so we would have the same domain, but we'd have to eliminate 0 from the domain. So, so that's the basic idea. Let's look at number 3. So here <coughs> we're asked to find, um, Let's see, the other zeros, we know that 3 is a zero of this polynomial function, we have to find the others. If 3 is a zero, then we know x minus 3 is a factor, and in fact, if we divide by x minus 3, we'll get the other factor, which is what I have here. Now, how did I get that? I use synthetic division, so 3 goes in the box, and we just use the coefficients here. Notice we're not missing any powers of x. 
And so I brought down the 1. 1 times 3 gives you 3. And then I added in the columns we always add. We get negative 4. And then I multiplied 3 and negative 4 to get negative 12. When you add, you get 8. Multiply, you get 24. And when you add, you get 0, which is what we expected. And so we're able to factor the original function. And in fact, if we set this factor equal to 0, we can solve for x to get our other two zeros. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't factor. When you set it equal to 0, now I ended up completing the square because you have a 1x squared and a negative, or I'm sorry, an even number here. It's actually quite easy to complete the square. Uh, using the quadratic formula would also work quite well as well. So the first thing you want to do is move this 8 to the other side by subtracting 8 on both sides. And then once you have these two terms isolated, you're going to take half of the negative 4 and square that. Negative 2 squared is 4, and so that's what we're adding to both sides. So this is what we call perfect square trinomial. We can write it as a perfect square. Uh, the way I get the minus 2, that's half of the negative 4. In fact, if you multiplied out 2x minus 2s, you could verify that this does equal that. Now on the other side you have negative 4. Now I can use the square root method and take the square root of both sides. I'll get x minus 2 on the left. And don't forget you got to do that plus or minus thing, uh, square root of negative 4 on the right. So we're going to end up with 2 plus or minus 2i. Remember the square root of a negative, you're going to be able to pull out an i. I also added 2 to both sides. So when you write your answer, it would be 2 plus 2i and 2 minus 2i. Let's go ahead and look at number 4. So here we have a piecewise function and depending on the value of our input or our x value we're going to use the corresponding piece. So basically it's like you have these three functions here. y equals negative 2x minus 19, y equals 2, and y equals x plus 6. And um, excuse me Let's see, um, so depending on the input, so if it's less than negative 3, you'll use this piece. If you're between negative 3 and 2, you'll use this piece, including negative 3. And if your input is 2 or bigger, you use this piece. So you can see here, negative 4 was less than negative 3, so I used this piece here. And you'll get negative 2 times negative 4 minus 19, which is negative 11. Now negative 2 is between negative 3 and 2, and so I use this piece where your output is always 2. And finally, I, I could have done either of the next two, but notice 2 and 9 are going to require you to use this piece because you're either equal to 2 or greater than 2, and so it'll be your input plus 9, or 6, so 9 plus 6, and you get 15. All right, let's move on to number five. <clears throat> All right, so on number five, this is an exponential function. Now, the two techniques that we usually use to solve exponential functions are where you have something like um, 2 to the 3x We'll just say 2 to the 3x equals um, 16. Well, you could write 16 as 2 to the 4th, and then you could set your exponents equal. So I called it the equal bases method. The other thing you could do, if you had like 2 to the x equals 5, you could rewrite this in log form, and that way you can solve for x. Now, in this case, we can't write both of these as a power uh, that's the same, and so the only thing we can do, we did do one like this, it's going to take some extra work. We can take the log of both sides, and then we have a property for logs, it's called the power rule, where we can move that exponent out front. And so that's what I did here. Now keep in mind, there were two terms here, so I need parentheses here, because I'm going to multiply the x and the 2 
each times log of 4. So that's what I did next. And then um, if I need to solve for x, I'm going to have to get both the x terms on the same side. So I subtracted x log of 4 on both sides. Now at this point, I need to factor out an x, which is what I did next. My GCF was x. And then finally, I can get this side, I can get the x by itself by dividing both sides by the log of 12 minus the log of 4. So my final answer is what we have here. We were asked to write it uh, as a decimal rounded to four decimal places, so that's what I got. I'll go ahead and show you how I got that. <clears throat> don't know why my screen doesn't show up a little bit nicer, but it's the best I can do. We've got 2 log of 4, and since it's just one term, we'll just do that divided by the log of 12. Now, this denominator has two terms, so I'm going to need parentheses here. Otherwise, order of operations is going to mess things up. We've got log of 12. Don't forget to close out your 12 with the parenthesis minus the log of 4. Again, close out the 4, but also need to close out the parentheses and the denominator that I started. And so now when you hit enter, you can see we do get the answer I gave you. All right, let's move on to number 6. <coughs> So first of all, you're borrowing $39,000, and it was borrowed from three different people, it looks like here. Oh, one at 6%, one at 8%, and one at 10%. Don't ask me why you had to go three different places, but we're just going to go with that. And the annual interest was $3,180. That's the interest that you would pay uh, for after one year for borrowing that money. It also tells us something here, we'll get to that, and that'll help us to write an equation. It does say use Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Gaussian elimination is just where you use row operations to put it in what's called row echelon form, and then you use back substitution to solve the system that you get. That's what we've been focused on mostly. Um, Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination, that's where you get ones or zeros above and, and below, I mean, the, the, the ones on the main diagonal. So with Jordan or Gauss-Jordan elimination, you also get zeros above the ones. So any word problem, though, on the final, I'm going to allow you to use your calculator. So we'll use the calculator on this one. There'll be another problem where we use row operations to solve a system. <coughs> all right, so first of all, this is the amount we borrowed at 6%, 8%, and 10%. The total borrowed was 39000 so that's one of our equations. The next one's going to deal with interest. How much interest did we earn from each of these accounts? The total interest was 3180 well, it's 6% of the amount that's in here, plus 8% of the amounts in here, and so on. Now, the last equation comes from here. The amount borrowed at 6% and 8%, or the total amount. So we're basically going to add those together. That would be x plus y was, or is, twice the amount borrowed at 10%. So the way you would write that, is the total uh, borrowed at 6 and 8 percent was or is twice the amount borrowed at 10 percent. Now notice I wrote the equation this way because I'm going to make a matrix or write a matrix and so I need the constants all on the right and we need to have our X's in this column, Y's and then Z's. So you can see I wrote the uh, corresponding matrix 
and then I would have you write R R E F. Oops, what did I do here? I guess I didn't have enough activity there. Let's keep going. So um, let's put this into the calculator. I'll show you how to do that. So first of all, you're going to hit second matrix, and we're going to edit matrix A. Notice it's highlighting matrix A. So when you hit enter, you'll edit. Now this is a three by four matrix, three rows by four columns. So in each case, as you put a number in, just so you would want to hit three, enter, four, enter, and then plug in the numbers. You can see I've already put them in. So uh, you may want to stop the video and do that. Now, depending on which calculator you, you're using, you may or may not be able to see everything here. I know you can, uh, on an 83, for example, you can scroll left or right. But uh, there's another way you can s verify that you put in all your numbers right. Let's do second quit. If you do second matrix, and notice it's on option A, just hit enter. And then enter again. And notice you can see the matrix and you can just double check you want to make sure your numbers are in correctly because if even one of them's wrong it's going to mess everything up okay so now I know that it's correct I'm going to clear this second matrix we're going to do some math on this matrix we want to put it into reduced row echelon form that's where we have ones on the main diagonal zeros above and below and so if you go down little ways you'll find R R E F now row echelon form is what we were doing before when we didn't get zeros above the ones and we used back substitution this is the one we want to use here now notice it doesn't have our matrix in there we're gonna to have to go back into the matrix menu second matrix and choose matrix A just hit enter and then you can close out the parentheses although you don't have to and then hit enter and you can see we have our answer. So you get 10,000, 16,000, and 13,000. Basically, this is x equals, y equals, and z equals. All right. Let's move on to number seven. Now, on number seven, you were asked to solve by completing the square. So you can see I got rid of the constant term, and I, I got my x squared and x term on the same side in that order. And then again, if you take half of the coefficient of x and square that, that's what you're going to add to both sides. So this is just negative 6 squared. And we get, when we write that in uh, squared form, it's x minus 6 quantity squared is equal to negative 16. Now we can take the square root of both sides. We'll get x minus 6 here is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 16. And so our final answer is, I just added 6 to both sides, and the square root of negative 16 is 4i. Remember, if you're taking the square root of a negative, you're going to have an imaginary answer. So again, you would write that as 6 plus 4i and 6 minus 4i. All right, I think we can do one more. All right, so on number eight, now we are using Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination. I'm going to use, well, this is going to end up being one of our special cases. Something to watch out for. Notice um, that if I multiply by two here, I have the same thing here. Or actually, if I multiply by negative two, I would have opposites. But if I also multiply this by negative two, these would be opposites. So this is going to be one of our special cases where x and y both are eliminated. So that's something to watch out for. Um, so I'll, I'll be doing, a, I think it's the last problem. You'll want to watch that and see how I approach that a little bit differently. On this one, I'm going to go ahead and use the regular steps that I use. So I, I, I wrote it uh, as a matrix, an augmented matrix. And unfortunately, there's no nice way to get a 1 here or here. I mean, I could always... If I could get a 1 here, I would just move, interchange the rows. So what I'm, But what I'm going to do, um, 
the easiest way to get a 1 here is just divide everything by negative 2. That will get me a fraction. Notice the second row doesn't change. Remember, dividing by negative 2 is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of negative 2. So when you divide each of these by negative 2, you get what I have here. And then now that I have a 1 here, I want to use that 1 to get a 0 below. So next I multiplied the first row by 1, or I'm sorry, by 4, added that to row 2, and that's the new row 2. And so you get this matrix here, and notice what, what I had talked about earlier happens here. We get zeros here and here. Now what that indicates is 0x plus 0y is equal to 10, or 0 equals 10, which is false, which indicates that there is no solution. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here, and I'll do a second. I'll probably do two more videos to wrap this up.